Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good day everyone. Uh, you are with me, Razia Adam, for JKE 316E Quantitative Economics course. This is a level 3 course for those who are taking a uh, Bachelor of Science of Economics in School of Distance Education, USM. And for the first part of this uh, course, I'll be covering the topic on introduction, data presentation, as well as descriptions. Okay, uh, welcome aboard everyone. So again, you are with me for JKE 316E Quantitative Economics. In case you are interested to know all about me, Razia Adam, you can refer to my website, okay, http.razia.webs.com. And if you have any question with regards to the course, you can email me at razia underscore adam at usm.my. Uh, the objective of the uh, session for today, okay, we'll be covering the first part of quantitative economics, okay, uh, we'll be looking at chapter one, okay, what is statistic, okay, here this is where I'll be. Uh, covering okay the key concept on quantitative economics or statistic and then we'll move on to chapter 2 and 3 okay we'll be looking at uh, graphical and tabular descriptive techniques okay where we discuss okay the different type of data graph as well as tables and then uh, we'll be also looking at chapter 4 on numerical descriptive techniques where we we'll learn about averages and variability for this course our main reference is uh, the text by Keller Okay, 2012. Uh, the title is Managerial Statistic 9 Edition, published by Southwestern Sangage Learnings, Mason. And you also require with you at all time, especially during uh, the practice as well as during exam, if you are taking the exam, okay, a scientific calculator. So I give example here, Casio FX 570W. Okay, for this course, JKE 316E. Uh, your textbook okay uh, that I mentioned just now is managerial statistic by uh, Gerald Keller okay 9th edition okay the textbook is shown on the left hand left hand side of the screen and you see uh, Casio uh, scientific calculator on the right hand side of the screen you need these two okay as your uh, main Bible for uh, for throughout the course for the course outline okay the topic that we'll be covering is divided into uh, seven major parts Okay, the first part, okay, like uh, what we'll be covering today, as I mentioned just now, we'll be looking at introduction of the course, okay, what is data presentation and what is data description, uh, those are two different things. Basically, this will be from chapter 1 to chapter 5, okay, managerial statistic by Keller. While the second part, okay, part 2 and 3, uh, I'll be covering the topic of uh, probability distributions, estimation, as well as hypothesis testing. That will be from chapter 5 to chapter 11. As for chapter 4 and 5, okay, I'll be discussing about inferences about population as well as the topic on ANOVA. That is from chapter 12 to chapter 15. Uh, chapter 6 will be on reg uh, regression as well as correlation okay, from chapter 16 to 17 okay, by Keller. And the final part of the course will be on time series as well as an extra topic that I will introduce to you that is on index number. Time series will be from chapter 20 from Keller. If you are a student of uh, School of Distance Education USM and uh, you are taking this at level 3 okay, of your Bachelor of Science Economics, okay, this is how you will be assessed. Okay, the first part of the assessment will be in terms of individual assignments. Okay, there will be 5 individual assignments that you have to do and all 5 will contribute uh, 20% toward the overall assessment. The second part of assessment will be in terms of tests, okay, midterm tests during the intensive week where you come to on campus. And these tests will contribute towards uh, your assessment uh, in, as a 20% percent, uh, percent, uh, percentage. And the final uh, part of the assessment will be in terms of final exam, a 60% contribution. Okay, let's talk about the first part of the uh, course assessment. Okay, the first part will be in terms of individual assignments. Okay, there will be five individual assignments. Uh, each one will contribute 4%. Okay, this individual assignment uh, is basically a chapter by chapter exercise, or we can say it's a practice problem which will be assigned per every chapter to provide you with the practice and also the guidance with the course material. You need to submit all of the exercise okay, to be graded and to be written back to you if you are our student and it will contribute 20% towards your overall assessment marks. Okay, uh, when, when we talk about the assessment just now, okay, the, the five individual assignments that you have to submit 
okay, are scheduled as uh, shown on screen. Okay, basically, if you are our student in PJJ or School of Distance Education USM, you are given two weeks after every video conference to submit your assignment either by email or by fax or by post or you can submit through the portal okay, to me okay, at the address shown on screen or you can use uh, the school okay, fax or you can email it as uh, I mentioned earlier at razia underscore adam at usm.my. Okay, uh, let's discuss about assignment instructions. Okay, this one is applicable whether you are out my student or you are not my student, okay, for the course. Okay, uh, when it comes to the assignments, okay, if you want to, uh, to score in terms of uh, quantitative economics, you have to practice especially in terms of calculations. So when you answer the uh, assignment questions or you answer the exam questions, you need to show your full work workings in terms of how you get the final answers. Okay, this will include the formula that you use, Okay, and then you need to replace the formula with appropriate figures and so forth. Okay, uh, when it comes to the individual assignments that you need to practice upon, you can do those uh, uh, calculations manually and then submit in your own handwriting. No need to use computer. As for the computer assignments, okay, those that involve uh, the use of computer as well as statistical software, what you need to do is you just send me the computer outputs, that is the results, the tables, Okay, and the statistical software that we use are referring to uh, Data Analysis Plus 9.0 in VBA, which uh, accompany your textbook. Data files are also available from the website. And for further detail, okay, could you please refer to Appendix 1, page 863 in Gerald Keller, uh, 9 edition. So this is how you'll be graded. Okay, the grading scale for the course, as you, as you can see on screen, Okay, the, the, those in red are basically uh, is, um, the one that I, I'm not interested that, you know, you get uh, these marks. I'm more interested if you score, for example, above uh, 80%, okay, basically that is an A or perfect uh, or four flats, or at least you can aim to get A- minus because uh, most of my students or I think everyone, okay, tend to think that quantitative cost is tough, so, but even though it's tough, it's actually... Uh, manageable provided you do the practice. So grades are calculated on cumulative percentages and are round up whenever possible. Okay, this is my expectation and also your responsibility throughout the course. I expect you as a student to be well prepared in terms of you have all the materials okay, with you when you are ready to learn. Okay, this material is uh, in terms of slide outlined, the textbook, the calculator that I shown you just now, Okay, your academic planner, okay, so you must have all these items ready with you at all time, okay, when you sit down to study. You also need to be uh, productive in terms of uh, doing the practice questions, okay, if you are a student of school or distance education, you need to turn your work on time, okay, and you must always do your best, okay, so for those students of uh, school of distance education, please make sure that you know your assignments due date, and make sure that you submit all courses, uh, all coursework on time. And uh, other than uh, the material that I mentioned just now, okay, you, there is a lot of resources available online. Okay, basically you can use the internet. You can use our portal. Okay, uh, in el.usm.my/pppjj. Okay, in order for you to learn more about the courses. This is tips for success. Okay, for those who 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 plan to score actually. Okay, I have only three tips for you. Okay, number one, okay, this is the most important. Okay, this is where you need to practice, practice, and practice. Okay, this is some similar to uh, those modern maths or ed maths that you took during uh, prime, uh, secondary school. Okay, if you practice in terms of doing the assignments, questions, basically you will have no problem at all during exams. Okay, we are not exam oriented, but the thing is you still be assessed, okay, in terms of exams. The tips number two is in terms of you need to be consistent and you need to study actively throughout the academic year. Okay, so at least okay, you need to spend a couple of hours of study time per week just for JKE 316 Quantitative Economics. And I would encourage you to actively participate in class by asking questions either during video conferencing or during intensive classes or during portal discussion. Discussion. My third tip for success is for you to actively participate by asking questions during video conferencing uh, session 
either during face-to-face -face classes during intensive week as well as during portal discussion and as I mentioned just now, uh, earlier you can always email me if you got questions okay uh, in order for you to learn more okay and to go beyond the syllabus that we cover okay the, the objective that we'll be covering for today's session okay part one is uh, the first one we'll be looking at chapter one okay what is statistic okay as I mentioned we'll be this is where we discuss the key concept of uh, statistic okay and the second uh, part of the uh, objective for today we'll be looking at chapter two and three graphical and tabular descriptive technique okay we'll be looking at the different type of data graph as well as table and chapter four we'll be looking at numerical descriptive techniques okay you will learn all about averages as well as variability if we look at chapter one okay uh, what is statistic of course you'll be wondering okay why uh, the course is titled as uh, jke quantitative economics but somehow okay the books and as well as the the syllabus outline okay are used okay the books use okay statistic okay it's more or less the same words okay quantitative economics okay we'll be using statistic actually for you to uh, discuss economics uh, subject or economics theory so do not get confused okay statistic is just a tool while the core things that you'll be discussing is about economics theory so i will try to include as much as possible okay economic discussion throughout the course okay let's look at the first part okay what is statistic okay statistic is a way to get information from data this definition um, is not important in exam but it's just for you to gain an intuitive idea what statistic is all about so basically you have data okay on one side and you want to have information on the other side so statistics is just the tool that you use to get from data to information so data is something like raw data okay it doesn't tell give you much in terms of information so information is the one that where you use it for decision making whether you are in business or you are in administration or you are just a student at phd level okay where you need to do your thesis so as i mentioned just now statistics is a tool for creating new understanding from a set of numbers i'll give you uh, one example okay about what is statistic is all about so this is uh, example 2.6 from a uh, textbook by kella okay where the uh, the example is about statistic anxiety okay let's say that uh, a student okay you yourself okay a student who believe that the myth that the cause okay it's difficult in terms of the cost is too mathematical the cost is tough okay and all that so to alleviate your anxiety okay you ask okay me okay the professor in this case about last or uh, last year result or last batch results okay so in this case okay i oblige and will provide you a list of the final mark which is composed of term work that is the assignment question as well as the midterm ex uh, test plus the final exam so from the marks okay what information can you obtain from the list we are still talking about the same example 2.6 statistic anxiety okay so here okay what you saw on screen is the final marks for the course for last batch okay as you can see on the screen okay what you have is just raw data okay this is what uh, we call as raw data where what you have is just row upon row of numbers okay it doesn't make sense unless you are very uh, clever or you are genius perhaps you can tell me okay uh, what you understand from these rows of numbers but basically this is only raw data it doesn't tell you anything about uh, the marks for final uh, exam for the last batch we are still on example 2.6 statistic anxiety let's say you are the students okay so what comes to your mind is or what interests you is for you to know okay what is the typical mark for a student who took this course okay last year okay so typical mark for this course can be interpreted as the mean okay the average marks or it can be in terms of median okay marks such that 50 percent above or 50 percent below so in this case statistic will tell you the answer that the mean or the average mark for the course is 72.67 percent or roughly 73 percent while the median okay the mark such that we have half the student at least got this uh, marks below or marks above 50 percent is 72 percent but the question now is does this enough information for you okay so that's another question that i leave for you to answer okay we are still on this statistic anxiety so 
other question that comes to your mind may be, okay, uh, like this one, are most of the marks clustered around the mean or are they more spread out? You want to know, okay, as a, as a whole, okay, the student that graduated last year, do they get, uh, all of them get 72% or you have a dispersion, okay, in terms of there are those who get very low marks and there are those who get very high marks. Uh, high marks perhaps 98 percent okay but the average is just 72 so to answer this question okay statistics tools okay tells you okay in terms of range okay so for range we have okay the highest marks the maximum marks okay deducted with the lowest mark or the minimum mark so from the raw data that i show you just now okay so you have the highest mark of 92 okay with the lowest mark of 53 so the range of mark for the student that took the course for last year is 39. Okay, what about variance? What about standard duration? So those are the things that we are going to learn. Uh, other questions that uh, you might also interested to know is, for example, are there many marks below 60? Or are there students who got, how many students who got above 80%? Those are considered a distinction student. What about the proportion of A, B, C, D grades? And in terms of a graphical technique, okay, statistical graphical technique, a histogram will provide us with this and other information. So this is a histogram, okay, a statistical tool that we use to explain about uh, the data on statistical anxiety just now. So you see on the uh, x-axis, so on the horizontal axis, so you have the marks, so you have the range, okay, uh, from 50%, 60%, 70%, 80 90 up to 100%. And then you have the frequency, the y axis, okay, on the uh, vertical scale. So a histogram tells you that, oh, okay, if you are a student who are interested to know about the cost, okay, the marks from last year shows you that, okay, oh, majority of the students score between uh, 70 and 80. Okay, there are those who score very well, okay, those who score hundreds, and there are a couple of few who score less. But as an average student, you can, you can be rest assured that the cost is not that tough because you see that on screen, okay, there are many students who get actually between 70 to uh, 90 marks. When it comes to statistics, there are two parts, okay? So statistics can be uh, divided into uh, first part, we talk about descriptive statistics, okay, from the word describe. Okay, the second part is what we call as inferential statistics. This is where you need to infer, okay, information from the data that is given. Now, let's discuss about descriptive statistics. This is the first part of uh, statistics. Okay, when we discuss descriptive statistics, it basically deals with methods of organizing, summarizing, and presenting data in a convenient and informative way. So basically, that is description of descriptive statistics. But what is more important for you to understand is that this, when you describe data, you can describe in two ways. You can describe in terms of graph, we call that graphical uh, descriptive statistic, or you can describe data in terms of uh, numbers, so we call that numerical descriptive statistic. Okay, so if we discuss data in terms of graph, in terms of pictures basically, okay, there are, there are many ways for you to describe uh, data as, uh, through graph. Okay, so we have the, the first part, as I showed you your example earlier, on histogram. You also learn about frequency distributions, okay, and as well as OJI. Okay, uh, when we come to bar chart or pie chart, okay, that is not new to you. You already covered that during your modern maths, okay, in secondary school. So I won't be covering those bar chart as well as pie chart. So I expect you to know about how to describe data using bar chart and pie chart because that one is too easy, okay, at your level, okay. On the right hand side, okay, of the diagram on screen, you can see that when you discuss data in terms of numbers, you can describe in three ways basically, okay. First is what we call as measure of central location, okay. The word is measure of central location or sometimes it's also called as measure of averages, Okay, so this is further divided into three uh, parts, okay, where we have means, we have medians, we have mode, okay. So averages or location is divided into these three, uh, okay, this is quite new, I guess, because most of the time when we talk about averages, okay, what you have in mind is just the word mean, 
Okay, statistically it's just mean. But I would like to introduce to you the concept of median as well as mode. Okay, the second, uh, the second way of describing numbers is by measuring variability of your data. Okay, so measure of variability or measure of dispersion, okay, can be in terms of range, can be in terms of variance, can be in terms of standard deviation. And the third part of numerical data description, okay, we, talk, we can talk about skewedness. Or this is where we discuss measure of skewedness. Is your data skewed to the right? Is your data skewed to the left? Okay, we'll discuss all about this, okay, later. Before we go further, okay, we're still talking about, okay, the two parts of statistics. Okay, just now I already explained what is descriptive statistic. And now it's time for us to discuss, okay, inferential statistic. Okay, we're going to discuss this example first before I give you the definitions. Okay, this is example 12.5 from the books by Keller. So we have competition among television networks in providing election coverage. Okay, the results are reported once the ballot are counted. However, for important offices such as the President of the United States of America, the networks actively compete to see which will be the first to predict a winner. Okay, so the question here is, uh, among the television networks, okay, they want to be the first to announce or the first to predict the winner of the pres uh, pres uh, presidential election for United States. Um, you can ignore the typos in the, the news that I captured from the internet. Okay, the sources is uh, given on top of the photos that you saw, you saw on screen. Okay, so just now when we talk about uh, United States presidential election, okay, we have one that just end recently on November, uh, I can't remember November, uh, the date, but basically you have the two contenders, okay, we have the uh, incumbent uh, president, okay, uh, Barack Obama, as well as the contender, okay, Mitt Romney. So both of them are contending for the uh, position of um, president of United States, okay, it's a four-year term, Okay, so Barack Obama is looking for a second term while uh, Mitt Romney is uh, trying to get into the White House. We are still talking about the uh, presidential election for the United States. So as you saw on screen, okay, uh, we have this nationwide poll that going into election day. Okay, before the actual election day, okay, people are very much interested to know who will actually win. Okay, who will actually uh, won the election such that okay they they are making prediction so how do people make prediction basically we need to have a poll before the actual election day so as you saw on screen okay so it shows that the president okay the, uh, the incumbent president Barack Obama was seen as holding a slim lead in many of the nine swing states Ohio is chief among them okay so from this poll okay before the election day people already predicted that you know Obama is more likely to win the uh, presidential election okay so you you can read further okay and you or you can go to the website okay for you to learn more about this uh, pres presidential election in united states so this is the result for the recent united states presidential election 2012 so we have obama okay who won the 57 quadrennial united states presidential election on november 6 okay that's the date that i was confused just now Okay, so this is in particular for the state of Florida. Okay, so you saw on screen that uh, this is on the actual election day. Okay, this is not the, the before uh, the election. So you saw on screen that Barack Obama is leading okay, at 51% ahead of Mitt Romney at 49%. So it's a slim majority as predicted earlier. In case you are wondering that, do you know, uh, has our cause suddenly turned into political cause? No. Okay, don't worry, you're still with me, okay, for JKE 316 Quantity Economics. It's just that I'm showing you example, okay, the use of statistics in terms of uh, political uh, presidential election in United States. So you saw on screen on the top bar, okay, the one in blue and red, uh, orange, okay, the blue is for Democrat, okay, basically that's for Obama, while the one in orange, okay, reddish orange is for Republican Mitt Romney. So this is the overall result of the presidential election. Okay, so we have Obama 51%, okay, slim majority, while Romney is 48%, okay, a uh, little bit lower, but basically a strong contender for the polls. Okay, so that's the result of the United States presidential elections.
Okay, what I show you just now, or what I discussed with you just now, is just uh, uh, the, the recent part of the United States presidential election. But there's one case in history, okay, that make uh, a major news, okay? So we are talking about uh, the United States presidential election, where we have in 1948, okay, um, where we have two contenders, okay, Dewey as well as Truman's. Okay, but on the morning after the 1948 president election, the Ch Chicago Daily Tribune's headline read, Dewey defeats Truman's. Okay, so that means they, they, they make, you must remember, when we talk about newspaper, okay, basically they print, okay, in the middle of the night, okay, they expect, okay, when we wake up in the morning, okay, we read the today's news. So such that, okay, they need to make a prediction who will win the election. Okay, in this case, they predict Dewey will defeat Truman's. But in actual fact, what happened is the other way around, Truman is actually the actual winner. Okay? So you, you saw on screen there a photo which shows that President Harry Truman as well as Thomas Dewey okay, that uh, cont uh, contended in 1948 presidential elections. So what I discussed just now is basically what we call as the big blunder. Okay? Imagine that you are the newspaper owner okay of the chicago daily tribune okay you publish the wrong info so what is the impression that you give to the public okay imagine this scenario if you look at the photo on screen so this is uh, captured during the uh, the day after the presiden presidential election so you have okay the president okay harry Trum s truman holding up a copy of the chicago daily tribune after his after his presidential election Okay, with the headline, a wrong headline, okay, let me re uh, repeat that to you, a wrong headline because Dewey is the winner, uh, Dewey is not the winner, Truman is the winner, but the newspaper already printed of, overnight, Dewey is the winner. So that is something that you have to be careful. When you make prediction, you want to make uh, a prediction as correct as possible. Okay, let's uh, leave United States and move on to Malaysia. Okay, so we are also interested to know, for example, in the next coming general election, who will win? Okay, we have uh, the Barisan National on one hand, we also have the uh, Pakatan Rakyat on the other hand. Okay, so who will win? So in that case, what we need to do, okay, is basically to have a poll. Okay, what is a poll? Okay, a poll is a random sample of voters who will be asked about whom they will vote. Okay. So from the data that is gathered from a poll, the sample proportion of voters supporting the candidate is computed. And then using statistical technique, okay, we will apply statistical technique to determine whether there is enough evidence to infer that the leading candidate will garner enough votes to win. So when we talk about Malaysia currently, we have our Prime Minister Najib Tun Razak. So uh, the Najib Tun Razak team okay, are most interested to be to have a poll to show that Najib will win more than majority more than slim majority we expect eighty percent majority for examples. Okay, uh, I do not have recent poll for Malaysia, but this is a poll that is gathered by Merdeka Center. Okay, for opinion research in August two thousand five, that is before the last general elections. Okay, at that time, okay, in August 2005, remember we have our general election last in 2008. Okay, as early as uh, August 2005, okay, the poll by Medical Center finds that the popularity of the current government has reduced from 85% to 74%. Why? Because at the, that particular time, the issue was the increase in oil prices, okay, uh, as much as 30 cents. Okay, and uh, with regards to the Hindroff, okay, issues in uh, 2007, okay, and with regards to other uh, price increases in March 2006, okay, pop popularity of the government has further reduced to 68% and then 61%. So you also see on screen, okay, there's another uh, poll by Medical Center right after the, the 12th general election in March 2008. Okay, at that time, okay, the popularity of the governments led by Abdullah Ahmad Bidaw, uh, Badawi, okay, uh, the Prime Minister at that time, was at the lowest ever, okay, at 53%. Okay, and the poll also uh, shows in terms of uh, the race divisions, okay, 58% okay, of the Malay respondents are happy with uh, Paklah leadership. While only 53% okay, of the respondents from uh, the Indian community, 
Okay, as well as Chinese community, 47% are happy with Pakla, okay, leadership. So the poll tells you, okay, whether, uh, who will likely win. So in this particular case, it's obviously that the Barisan National, okay, win in the election, won in the election. But for the next coming election, which is very near, okay, we do not know. So what uh, every party are interested in now is to predict who will be winning the election and they need to work hard in order to make sure that their popularity increase. So now we have come to the key statistical concept based on the discussion that I already uh, showed to you just now. Maybe you already come across the words such as populations, okay, what is sample, what is parameter, as well as statistic. Okay, so when we discuss population, okay, population refers to a group of all items of interest to a statistical practitioner. You are my student, okay, so both of us, we are now, okay, uh, can be called as statistical practitioner because we use statistics, okay, to make, uh, to derive information. Okay, when we discuss about sample, what is sample? Sample is just a set of data that is drawn from the population, okay. So population is a group of all items, while sample is part of populations. And then we have the word parameter. So what is parameter? Parameter is just a descriptive measure of population. Okay, while statistic, okay, specifically in this uh, particular definition, is referring to a descriptive measure of a sample. So if you discuss population, okay, your measure will be called as parameter. If you discuss sample, your measure will be called as statistic. We are still discussing about the key concept just now. Okay, what is population, what is sample, what is parameter, what is statistics. So if you look at the left hand side of the screen, so you have a bigger dots, okay, or blue, uh, red, yellow and all colors. Okay, so that's basically represent the item or the observation that falls under populations. While sample, okay, in this case, are referring to a smaller group, a subset of populations. So when we, uh, another example that comes to mind, perhaps, okay, uh, when we discuss uh, the school of distance educations, okay, so if you are registered for JKE three one six, okay, quantitative economics, so that represents one small sample. While the whole population of uh, school of distance education consisted of those who are taking. Uh, managements, okay, those who are doing their anthropology, sociology, okay, biology and all that. So that is the whole population of school of decent education. Okay, and from populations, you have the measure that we call parameter. Well, from sample, the same thing, but for sample is what we call as statistic. So bear in mind, okay, when we discuss populations, populations have parameter. While when we, we discuss sample, samples have statistics. Okay, so back to inferential statistic. Okay, remember statistic, we have two parts, descriptive statistic, and then we have inferential statistic. Okay, so statistical uh, descriptive statistic describe the data sets. Okay, so the uh, statistical descriptive statistic describe the data set, but does not allow us to draw any conclusions or make inferences about the data. You just describe, that's it, finish. But once we, we need to make information, though, then you need inferential statistics. So what is inferential statistics? This is a set of method used to draw conclusions or make inferences. Okay, make inferences means you want to estimate perhaps, or you want to make prediction perhaps, or you want to simply make a decision. Okay, so uh, it can be about anything, okay, with regards to the different characteristics of population, but you make your inference based on sample data. Okay, so that's why the importance of just now the key concept from populations to samples, from parameter, okay, you have the statistic because you need that for to make inference. Uh, inference. We are still discussing inferential statistics. Okay, so we, this is uh, more or less the same definition, but I show it in terms of uh, diagram, okay, to make it uh, easier for you to understand. As I mentioned earlier, statistical inference is the process of making an estimation or prediction or uh, decision making about a population based on sample. So you have on the right hand side of the screen, okay, uh, data from samples. So from there, you can measure statistics, okay, about the sample. 
and based on that information okay you can draw okay the population parameter okay so what can you infer about a population parameter basically the answer will come from a sample statistic so inferential statistic it is a concept where you use sample statistic to describe or to explain population parameter next we are still discussing statistical inferences, okay? Uh, basically, this is the rationale why you need to make an inference, okay? Uh, the rationale is that large population may investigating each member, okay, impractical as well as in, in, uh, expensive. Imagine, okay, if uh, we are interested to know who will win the next election. Are you going to go around Malaysia and ask everyone, for example, okay, are you going to choose... Uh, Barisan National or are you going to choose okay, a candidate from the Pakatan Rakyat? Okay? So, it's impossible to do that because remember Malaysia, for example, we have from as far as uh, Perlis in okay, up north, okay, down to uh, Johor, okay, south, and then we also have the, uh, the other side across the South China Sea, okay, Sabah and Sarawak. So, that will be very costly, okay, it's very uh, impractical. So that's why, okay, it's easier and cheaper to take a sample, okay, ask a few people from police, okay, to represent the rural area as well as those from Sabah and Sarawak, okay, and then you need to uh, take a sample from those in Putrajaya, Kuala Lumpur, and perhaps uh, Melaka, for example, okay, to represent the urban area, and from there you can estimate about the popularity of the current government, okay, and make estimates about the population from the samples. But bear in mind, okay, when you are doing statistical inferences, okay, however, such conclusion estimates are not always going to be correct, okay? So for this reason, we built into the statistical inference, okay, a measure of reliability which we call as confidence level or significance level. So we have the 95% confidence level, or the 98% confidence level when we discuss the topic of estimation and then we also have the 5% significance level or the 1% significance level when we discuss the topic of hypothesis testing okay you will come to know about the difference and the similarity of these two okay when we discuss those topics much later okay we have come to the second part for today's session okay now we are moving on to chapter 2 and 3 where we discuss graphical and tabular descriptive techniques. Okay, here this is where we discuss the different type of data, okay, graph as well as tables. Next. In graphical and tabular descriptive techniques, okay, we have a variables. Okay, the symbol for variable it can be in terms of x, in terms of y, or in terms of z. Okay, so a variable is just some characteristic of a population or a sample. So in this case, okay, uh, the example that is written here is students' grades. Okay, what do you get for the last uh, exam, for example? Or it can be in terms of your weight, okay, in kilogram or in pound. Or it can be your height. Or it can be in terms of GDP of Malaysia, GDP of United States, GDP of Japan. That is a variable, economic variables. Okay, it can be in terms of quantity demand, quantity supply. That is another economics variables. Okay, so the value of this variable are the range of possible values. For example, when we discuss student marks, the range of uh, uh, values can be from zero, student who score zero, okay, or student who score perfect hundred. When we discuss weight, for example, for an adult, okay. It can be uh, it can be anything okay same thing when we discuss okay GDP okay in a billion ringgit or billion US dollar okay a high in centimeter or high in feet okay so data are the observed value of a variable okay what you observe okay uh, the variable just now when we discuss student grade what you observe in terms of uh, the marks okay there are those who get 67 there are those who get 74 75. Uh, 71, 83 and so on and so forth. So those are the observation. So when we talk about uh, your variable, your variable is student marks, but what you actually observe are the numbers. In statistics, there are three different types of data and information. Okay, so this is uh, for the purpose of statistics, you can divide data into three main groups. So you have the first one is what we call as interval data. And the second one is what we call as nominal data. 
And the third one is what we call ordinal data from the word order. Let's look at the first type of data. Okay, this is what we call as interval data. Another name for interval data is also what we call as quantitative data from the word quantity or numerical data from the word uh, numbers. Okay, numeric, numeric. So in this case, interval data includes real numbers. So when we discuss height, when we discuss weight, when we discuss prices, okay, when we discuss GDP, for example, those involve real numbers. So when we talk about real numbers, okay, arithmetic operation can be performed on interval data. So it is meaningful for you to talk about two times height or price plus one dollar or GDP divided by per capita, the number of population. So those are what we call as interval data. The second type of data is what we call as nominal data. By right, okay, nominal data is also known as qualitative data. Okay, please bear in mind you need to be able to differentiate these two words that I introduced to you just now. Okay, quantitative, okay, which refer to uh, interval data, while qualitative from the word quality is for nominal data. Another name for nominal data is what we call as categorical data. Why I'm giving you all these different names? Because sometimes, okay, if you look at the uh, uh, resources that are available online or if you look at the different textbooks that discuss statistics, okay, in particular, they use all these different uh, words. So you must be able to know that, oh, this is basically the same thing, whether we are discussing nominal data or whether we are discussing qualitative data or categorical data, they are all more or less the same. And... When we discuss nominal data, the value of nominal data are in terms of categories. Okay, first thing that comes to mind when we discuss marital status. So marital status can be in terms of you are single, okay, you give a quote, uh, or you are married, you are divorced, or you are widowed. Okay, in terms of uh, Malaysian, for example, we, when we feel informed, there are an issue whether do you need to state your status uh, in terms of race, whether you are Malay, you are Indian, you are Chinese or uh, others. Okay, in terms of your income, for example, instead of stating your actual income, okay, when we answer questionnaire in particular, when we feel informed, okay, you have to tick a box whether your income is below uh, 1,000 ringgit, your income is between 1,000 ringgit and 2,000 ringgit, your income is uh, greater than 3,000 ringgit and so on and so forth. So, it's category data, not uh, quantitative uh, data, not qualitative data. Before we go further into these graphical and tabular techniques, I hope you can think of an example of your own Okay, when we discuss the different type of data as I mentioned earlier, when we discuss the uh, quantitative data or the interval data and then we have the qualitative data and then we have the ordinal data. Do think of an example of your own okay, and try to see that you know these three type of data okay, they are very much different from each other. Okay, so how we are going to present this nominal data? Okay, to present nominal data in terms of graph and table, okay, what you need to do is to count the frequency of each value of the variables. You need to count the frequency of each value of the variables. Okay, uh, this will present the categories uh, okay, later and they are count in a frequency distribution table. Okay, and then, okay, uh, you will have a relative frequency distribution that lists the category and the proportion which, which okay, each will occur. Okay, I'll show you next. This is a, uh, from an example 2.1 from the textbook by Keller. Okay, so again, as I uh, already show you, this is just raw data. You have row upon row of numbers. Okay, how you're going to have the different type of data okay, shown in the graph? Okay, let's see what happened next. Okay, this is what statistic will be able to do. Okay, the statistical tool that we have, okay, will make sure that from row upon row of numbers that you saw just now in terms of raw data. So you, you see here a very nice table, okay, in terms of the different type of beer, okay, and then the frequency, okay, and then in terms of relative frequency. Okay, so it's... This one is where if you are the marketing of this particular brand or if you are uh, into this uh, beer market, okay, so you see that, oh, which one is more um, 
uh, more popular okay then you have the highest relative frequency okay out of 100 while the actual frequency is in terms of 285 observations in terms of graph okay whatever that you have just now in terms of the different type of beer in the market okay this is example from the books i know some of you does not agree with the example on beer but just bear in mind this is just an example for the sake of understanding the concept so based on the different category of beer okay you can present this in terms of uh, bar chart okay take note okay what you have on screen is what we call as a bar chart okay so you see all the uh, the different bar with different length okay the bar is used to display frequency okay so you have the different category of uh, beer just now in the, on the horizontal axis from number one the first up to the number seven and then you have the relative frequency on the vertical axis okay from zero to hundred okay and the the height of the bar shows the relative frequency so from at a glance you can see that oh which is the first in terms of most popular the second one and the third one is quite a close time and then you have the lowest one okay you can gain all this information within a glance by looking at this graph so a good statistician will be able to show such information okay from the raw data that we have you must be able to produce the information in such graph okay in this case we are discussing bar chart but remember I told you that bar chart is for the lower level. At your level, okay, level 3 of university courses, I expect you to do more than just a bar chart. We are still discussing nominal data. Okay, we are still discussing relative frequency just now. Okay, the same information about the different type of beer, okay, that is shown earlier in terms of bar chart, you can show it now in terms of a pie chart. Okay, so you have one pie okay think of a pizza here okay we have the different slice okay in different colors so you need to assign a legend okay in this case number one refer to the first type of brand of beer okay uh, 31 percent okay relative frequency okay and then you have all the other six brand okay uh, which uh, fill in the the whole pie chart we have now a second example still about nominal data okay so from example in table 2.3 this is where uh, the textbook discuss the total energy consumption of the United state from all sources in 2005 it's a bit outdated never mind okay but basically we are going to see about energy consumption in united states okay the units is in terms of uh, metric ton okay, or thousand kilogram okay and then the energy consumption is measured in terms of the heat content of oil equivalent okay so in this case okay the united states burn an amount of coal and coal product equivalent to 545,259 metric tons of oil okay so in uh, if you are statistical practitioner you need to have an appropriate graphical technique to depict this figure we are still discussing nominal data okay this is from example in table 2.3 we are discussing about energy consumption in the united states so you have a nice table here okay which give you the information about the different type of energy sources in united states and in terms of their heat content in terms of oil equivalent okay so if you look at the left hand side we have the non-renewable energy sources okay we have the coal and coal products we have oil we have natural gas and we also have the nuclear uh, energy okay on the bottom part we have the renewable energy sources in terms of hydroelectric, in terms of solid biomass, and then we also have others in terms of liquid biomass, geothermal, solar, wind, tide, and wave, and the oceans. And then you have the total figures. Does it make sense to you? Does it tell you about the relative relationship between these different type of energy sources? Because of that, you need to have graph to show this information in a better way. So now what we have is again a pie chart to show about energy consumption in the United States. From the tables that is uh, being produced okay you can have this pie chart to easily uh, show to the uh, whoever is reading your report perhaps if you're manager okay uh, ministry of energy or something you can show that oh okay the the, the bulk of the uh, energy consumption in the state is made out of oil at 40 percent and then you have coal and coal product at 24 percent which is followed closely by natural gas at 23 percent the rest are very much a smaller proportion of the 
total energy consumption. So this is what the we see the purpose of statistic. Okay, if you make the information easier to be gained at one glance instead of you need to read the table, you cannot see the you know relationship between all the different type of energy sources. So from the different type of data, we already discussed okay how you present uh, nominal data in terms of graph. So now it's time for us to discuss how you're going to present interval data using graph. So for interval data, you will present in terms of a graph that we call as histogram. Okay, what is histogram? Histogram is used to summarize interval data and also to help explain probabilities. Okay, in example 3.1, we created a frequency distribution of the five categories. Okay, we are going to discuss this uh, in detail later. So basically, in example 3.1, we also create a frequency distribution by counting the number of observations that falls into a series of intervals that we call classes. We are still discussing about example 3.1. Basically, the example 3.1 is about long-distance telephone bills in United States. Okay, we have chosen eight classes. Okay, where each observation must falls into one and only one class. Okay, out of your all overall observation, you must make sure each observation, each uh, data point falls under one of these eight group. Eight classes is more or less like eight groups. So you must categorize into the first group, okay, the amount of telephone bills that is less than 15 US dollar, okay, and then you have the second group, the amount of telephone bills that is greater than 15 US dollar, but up to, but not include 30, and then you have the amount of telephone bills in the third group that are greater than 30, but uh, less and up to 45 dollar, and so on and so forth. So this is the classes or the group of uh, your observations. Based on the raw data on uh, telephone bills just now, long distance telephone bill in example 3.1, okay, you can provide the information by using a simple histogram. So you see on screen, okay, a histogram about long distance telephone bills. So you have the amount of telephone bills, okay, between zero and 15 USD. Okay, and then up to 30, and then 50, uh, 45, 60, 70, and then you have up to the highest range, 120 USD. While on the vertical axis, you have the frequency, okay, in terms of 0 to 80, because uh, you can show up to 100, but basically the highest is only 70 uh, plus or more. Okay, so you have, okay, the telephone bills, okay, uh, which uh, the bulk of the people, okay, are having a lower range of tele long distance telephone bills. But there are also a couple, uh, quite a number of people who are paying a uh, quite significant amount of long distance telephone bills. While those in the middles, okay, there are less in numbers. So this is how you interpret a histogram. Okay, take note. Okay, um, take a histogram is very much different from bar chart. Okay, it's a one easy way for you to uh, to note is that. When you discuss bar chart, okay, each bar are separated from another. While in histogram, you see that the bar are linked to each other because this is for continuous data or for interval data. So that's why the different type of definition of data is very important. So if you have, uh, if you have um, nominal data, then you use bar chart. If you have interval data, then you use histogram. You need to know the different type of data and the right methods of, or the right graph to present your data. So back to this example 3.1 about long distance telephone bills in the United States. Okay, you can read the details about the data sets in the textbook. But basically, okay, if you are a manager of this company, for example, you are like Ananda of Maxis. Okay, you, you, are, you, you can make a better business plan in terms of, you know, what are the telephone package you are going to offer by looking at this histogram. So you have about half, okay, 71 plus 37, which uh, equals to 108 of the bills, which are relatively small, that means less than 30 US dollar, while you have another 30%, 18 plus 28 plus 14 plus 60, divided by 200, Okay, 30% or nearly one third of telephone bills are great more than 90 US dollar. While in between, there are only a few telephone bills in the middle range. So maybe, okay, when we talk about uh, telephone usage in Malaysia, okay, we have those students, okay, perhaps, okay, you need to get 
to provide a package okay host bills are small okay i don't know amount okay maybe 30 ringgit top up per month perhaps in malaysia and then you have those okay professionals or those uh, business okay people who have you who have a lot more usage in terms of data services in terms of making actual uh, video calls and so on and so forth okay they spend a lot in terms of their phone bill so you must be able to provide different uh, package for them so you gain this information from a histogram or for interval data the next question is for you to know um, is it easy to build a histogram okay that is a big question now okay first what you need to do is collect the data okay number two or the second step is for you to create a frequency distribution table for the data and in order for you to create a frequency distribution table for the data first you need to determine the number of classes or the number of group to use how you're going to divide into groups okay let's refer to table 2.6 we are still talking about the approximate number of classes in frequency distribution so in this case the textbook is already making it easier for you okay they have this table okay if you have less than 50 observation then your number of classes shouldn't be more than five to seven okay if you have observation between 50 to 200 then the number of group okay for your relative uh, frequency distribution must be between roughly between seven to nine okay number of classes or groups okay and then if you have 200 observations such as in example 3.1 okay long distance telephone bills then you should have between seven and ten okay a number of classes and so on and so forth you can see that you don't need to memorize this but it's just that uh, it's just a rule of thumb okay for an alternative measure you can use Sturgis formula in order to determine the number of classes okay by using this 1 plus 3.3 log n n is your number of observation so you have two choice either you look at these tables when it comes to determining the number of classes or you can use the formula okay in order for you okay uh, to know how many group you need to create we are still discussing about uh, creating a frequency distribution table for your data after you determine the number of classes to use just now okay by looking at the table that is provided in the text we know that oh roughly okay for this set of raw data for uh, long distance telephone bills we must have around eight classes or eight groups okay now the question is how large is to make each class okay you need to determine this uh, the size of the class so what you need to do now look at the range of the data okay range of the data is given by the largest observation minus the smallest observation so you need to go back to your raw data and look at the larger observation in this case the highest telephone bills stood at 119 uh, US dollar and 63 cents while the smaller observation I do not know whether it's possible okay is zero uh, USD okay in Malaysia I don't think we have zero phone bill because we have a minimum amount that we have to pay per month okay just put that aside so in this case the range of your data is 119 USD and 63 cents so you have just now uh, you already determined the number of classes that you are going to have eight more or less okay and then you have your range so you divide range with the number of classes uh, so in this case try and error so you know that the, each class we should be around 15 okay so how you get this 15 more or less you divide the range okay which is largest observation minus small observation divide by the number of classes which is 8 so you get 15 still discussing about histogram how you you build a histogram and we are still discussing uh, examples 2.4 about long distance telephone bills in the United States. Okay, the raw data are given in the textbook. Okay, this is uh, a table 2.5 frequency distribution table of long distance bills. Okay, so you have on the left hand side, okay, the groups or the class limit. Okay, and on the right hand side, okay, of the screen, you see the frequency. So you have a total of 200 observations. Okay, those people with telephone bills that you actually observe. And then you have the first group, okay, those telephone bills between 0 and up to 15. Okay, you have 71 uh, people. And then you have 15 to 30, okay, you, you need to actually count, okay, those bills between 15 to 30 and you get 37. 
and then you count those telephone bills between 30 to 45 US dollar you get 13 okay and you do the rest until the the last one okay the last group from 105 to uh, uh, 120 US dollar you have 14 uh, people okay from the table of frequency distribution for the long distance telephone bills okay then you can create a, a histogram okay bear in mind okay uh, I'm not going to ask you to actually draw the histogram during exam because uh, at high levels okay we can use the computer to do this okay I expect you to be able to do this based on the steps given the textbook okay and using the software that is uh, that comes along with the textbook okay you just click okay with the steps given okay you will be able to produce this histogram for the long distance telephone bills okay as uh, we already uh, discussed earlier okay when we discuss histogram there are many different shapes okay but one thing that you need to know uh, the important thing when you look at histogram is to see whether a histogram is symmetry or not okay a histogram is said to be symmetric if and when we draw a vertical line down the center of the histogram the two sides are identical in shape and size so if you look at the first histogram on the left hand side okay the bar are more or less equal length uh, uh, from left hand side and the right hand side of the, the histogram okay so you put the line in the middle so this is symmetrical and if you look at the one in the middle okay the bar of equal length throughout the uh, horizontal axis so you put a line in the middle okay the same uh, length so they are still symmetrical and then you have the one on the right hand side okay on the far right hand side corner so you have a histogram with different shape but once you put once you put a red line in the middle a vertical line in the middle okay so you see that oh they are symmetry okay right hand side is similar to the left hand side so the different shape of histogram okay the next part that you need to know okay is the shape that we call as skewed or skewedness a skewed histogram is the one with long tail extending to either to the right or to the left okay if you look at the one uh, okay on your left hand side the histogram on the left hand side is what we call as positively skewed okay remember just now when we discuss a symmetric histogram okay the right hand side and the left hand side are supposed to be similar in shape so in this case when you uh, the, uh, when you come across a positively skewed histogram you, okay it's called positively skewed because you have a long tail okay uh, on your right hand side of the histogram so that is positively skewed on the other hand if you have the tail okay on the left hand side of the histogram okay uh, this one is the histogram on your right hand side so that one is what we call as negatively skewed this is how you describe the shape of histogram by simply looking at the histogram but uh, statistically we can also use a quantitative measure to actually measure whether it's positively skewed or negatively skewed or whether it's no skewedness that means it's perfectly symmetrical another way of describing the shape of histogram is by looking at the modality okay a unimodal histogram is one with a single peak while a bimodal histogram is the one with two peaks okay look at the right hand side first okay right hand side first so you have only one peak so we call that a unimodal histogram okay while a bimodal histogram on the left hand side of the screen you see a two peak okay uh, there's uh, it looks like you have two histograms combined together okay so a model class is the class with the largest number of observation later on we come across mode when we discuss the different shape of histogram what we are most interested in is to have a bell shaped histogram a bell shaped histogram is a special type of symmetrical unimodal histogram that is bell shaped as shown on the screen so you have the right hand side equal to the right hand side okay and you have a red line okay to show that oh it's symmetrical and then you have only one peak so it's a unimodal, unimodal okay so many statistical techniques require that the population to be bell shaped later on when we discuss estimations okay you come across normal distribution okay this will be repeated throughout our discussion when it comes to hypothesis testing okay and then ANOVA and everything else so a normal distribution is basically referring to a bell shaped histogram okay where the right hand side equals to the right hand side of the uh, histogram okay you have only one mode 
and by drawing the histogram you can help verify the shape of the population in questions okay just intuitively you can think of let's say when we discuss about the weight of people in Malaysia okay you can calculate okay the average weight okay let's say we look at a female uh, in uh, you know um, above 25 up to 50 for examples okay these groups okay you you have people around the mid average wage there will be a few people who will be overweight more than 100 kg for example there'll be those okay ladies who are very slim okay but the bulk of the female in between this 25 and 50 year age okay if we are looking at that particular group they are about the average weight same thing when we discuss exam marks Okay, if you look at a normal distribution of student in a particular batch or a particular year, you will have one or two very good student who score very good result, okay, distinction student. On the other hand, you have one or two very um, less than average student who score very poorly. But average students, okay, you get around 50 to 60 marks, okay. So this is uh, what we call as normal distribution and how you know it's a normal distribution by looking at the histogram it's symmetrical it's unimodal like what is shown on screen it's a bell-shaped curve what's the use of having a histogram okay this is one way of using histogram okay by comparison uh, comparing the histogram so in this particular examples okay we want to compare and contrast the following histogram based on data from examples 2.6 as well as example 2.7 so we have two courses business statistics as well as mathematical statistics okay which have very different histogram so in this case if you look at uh, the histogram on your left hand side okay that one is example 2.6 for business statistic okay the histogram is unimodal okay and then you have uh, the majority of the student who gets between um, uh, 70 to 90 marks okay the bulk of them okay there are those who score very poorly and there are one or two who score very well and compare that with example 2.7 okay for mathematical statistic course okay where instead of having one model okay this mathematical statistic it has two or uh, by model okay uh, by model histogram and you see the distribution of marks look weird okay so you have uh, quite a number of those who get less than 70 and then you have those who quite who have uh, 80 above okay to 90 and surprisingly very few who score okay the average mark between 60 to 70 and you can also look at the spread of the marks or the the range of the marks okay so which one which course that perform better to your, your to your thinking is it the business statistic course okay or is it the mathematical statistic course of course okay the, the course differ because of other external factors but if you are interested statistically business statistic course, business statistic course is much uh, more normal okay in terms of you are uh, if you are uh, registering under this course okay chances on average you score about 70 to 90 marks while okay if you are registering for mathematical statistic okay if you look at this uh, 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 distributions okay it can be that you score very well or it can be that you score very poorly so you don't know okay the second part okay under uh, graphical technique for interval data okay other than histogram the, okay just now is what we call as ogive okay it's pronounced as ogive so what is an ogive ogive is a graph of cumulative frequency distributions i already introduced to you okay what is frequency distribution okay where you count okay according to the groups and then you have the relative frequency distributions okay uh, in terms of percentages out of 100 now okay i introduced to you the word cumulative frequency distributions so we have three steps okay uh, in order to create or drive first step is where you need to use uh, the frequency distribution that you created earlier and calculate the relative frequency okay relative frequency formula is given as the number of observation in a group divided by the total number of observations in order for us to calculate relative frequency for example okay we had 71 observation in our first class 
Okay, that means you need to tally this from the raw data. Okay, we are still using example from long distance telephone bills just now. So we have a range of telephone bills from 0 USD up to uh, 15 USD for the first groups. Okay, you count. Okay, how many data observed that actually falls within this range? Okay, so you have that 71 out of total uh, observation of 200. So percentages or relative frequency is 0.355. Okay, and then you do the next thing for the second group for the telephone bills between 15 USD up to 30 USD. Okay, you observe there are 37 people. Okay, you divide by 200 total observations, so you get 0.185 and so on and so forth. Okay, the thing for you to note is uh, for relative frequ frequency, okay, when you add up all the relative frequency, it must equal to 100. So in this case, okay, 0 0.35 plus 0 0.18, 0 0.0604 and so on, okay, it's add up to 1. Or if you use percentages, okay, 35.5% plus 18.5% plus 6.5% and so on and so forth, it add up to 100. Okay, when we discuss ogive, okay, what is an ogive? Ogive is a graph of a cumulative frequency distributions. We can create ogive in three steps. Okay, the first step, okay, as uh, uh, I already discussed just now, okay, you need to calculate the relative uh, frequencies. The next step is for you to calculate cumulative relative frequencies. Just bear in mind, okay, you have all this cumulative relative frequency. How do you calculate this? You need to add the current class relative frequency to the previous class cumulative relative frequency. And you need to take note, for the first class, it's... Uh, cumulative relative frequency is simply its relative frequency. We are still using the relative frequency distribution table from earlier. It's just that now you need to have another column. Okay, I add another column on the right hand side of the uh, the tables. Okay, so you have okay on the left hand side the class limits or the class groups, and then you have the middle column the relative frequency. Okay, remember relative frequency must total up to hundred or in point form is up to 1 and the cumulative frequency is in term of okay uh, for the first uh, row for the class limit between 0 to 15 cumulative relative frequency is similar to the relative frequency so it's still 0 0.355 okay if uh, when you go to the second row okay for the class limit between 15 to 30 uh, the cumulative relative frequency is simply the first uh, cumulative relative frequency which is 0 0.35 plus the current relative frequency which is 0 0.18 okay so you add up those two so you get 0 0.54 okay that means the first class plus the next class okay for the third row for the class limit between 30 to 40 what you need to do is took the the last cumulative frequency point okay which is 0.54 you add with 0 0.065 for the current group so you get 0 0.605 okay same thing for the next row for 45 to 60 uh, usd class limits okay you take the earlier one 0 0.605 you plus the current relative frequency of 0 0.045 so you get cumulative frequency relative frequency of 0 0.65 you do this for the rest and eventually for the last group okay for the class limit between 105 to 120 us dollar okay what you get is it has to be cumulative relative frequency of one or if we are using percentages it should equals to 100 okay so that is the cumulative relative frequency table you need this in order for you to draw an ogive. So this, the third step for you to draw an ogive after you calculate the relative frequency in step 1 and then you calculate the cumulative relative frequency in step 2. The third step is for you to draw an ogive. So this is how you draw an ogive. Your variable of interest must always lies on the horizontal axis. So our variable of interest in this case is the amount of telephone bills. So put that on the horizontal axis or the x axis while the frequency, the cumulative frequency or the relative frequency, you put that on the vertical axis. So this is uh, based on the cumulative relative frequency column just now. You take that point, you put it on the uh, diagram and then you connect the points. So what you have here is an ogive. 
What's the use of having an ojai? Just now, okay, when we draw histogram, you are also interested to know what's the use of having a histogram. So same thing, an ojai can be used to answer questions like in this case, what is the amount of telephone bills that is at the 50th percentile? That means you are interested to know what is the amount of uh, telephone bills that fall right in the middle of the whole distributions. Okay, so we have just now remember, okay, as low as zero uh, USD telephone bill, as high as 120 USD. So the, the 50th percentile, okay, will fall around 35 US dollar. Okay, so all this ojive, okay, that we discussed, you can refer to figure 2.13 in the textbook by Keller. So we have come to the end of chapter 2, okay, this is the summary of what we discussed so far. So remember, I already discussed with you, okay, three different types of data. So we have the nominal data, we have the interval data, we also have ordinal data. Okay, and then I'll describe, okay, the different method to present your data in graph and tables. Okay, so we have, most importantly, histogram and ogive for interval data. So that, this is the, the crux of the chapter 2 that I would like for you to uh, learn in details because the rest of the discussion in the next chapters will fall on these two uh, concepts of histogram and ogive. If you look at nominal data, Okay, nominal data and uh, interval data, both are for single set of data. So just now, relative uh, frequency, tables, bar, and pie chart, okay, that one is under nominal data for single set. Okay, histogram is for interval data. Okay, while if you are di discussing relationship between two variables, that means you have two variables of interest. Let's say you are discussing GDP, uh, as well as uh, inflation or GDP as well as unemployment or demand, quantity demand, quantity supply or quantity demand and price. So that one you need to pre use uh, a different type of uh, diagram or different type of graph. For example, in this case, you can use a scattered diagram for time series uh, observation. Okay, for nominal data, you have all the different cross classification table, bar chart and so on and so forth. But our focus for chapter 2, I want you to know all about histogram and ogive. Okay, we have come to chapter 4. This is about numerical descriptive techniques. Before we proceed further, I would like for you to take a break. You can go to this website as stated on screen. Okay, uh, YouTube website. I hope you, you got to enjoy this uh, show. Okay, and you know, uh, remember, you know, that uh, the course is not that tough. You can make it fun, okay? You can make it uh, very much interesting, okay? Just you need for you to uh, do some research online for you to be able to understand the course better, okay? Enjoy the show. Okay, chapter 4, okay, of the first part is uh, about numerical descriptive techniques. Earlier on in chapter 2 and 3, I already discussed with you, okay, the graphical and tabular descriptive techniques. Okay, so in this uh, chapter 4, numerical descriptive techniques, I will discuss about measure of central location. Okay, we, where we will discuss about mean, median, and mode. I hope you remember just now, okay, the song that will be playing in your mind, we mean, median, and mode. Okay, you remember that, okay, from the YouTube video. Okay, and then we also discuss measure of dispersion or measure of variability in terms of range, standard deviation variance as well as coefficient of variance there are a lot of other numerical descriptive techniques for example measure of relative standings indirectly we'll discuss a bit about percentiles as well as quartiles okay we also have measure of linear relationship covariance correlation coefficient determination least square lines you we'll come across this when we discuss regression and correlation in the other chapter Covariance, okay, we have it when we discuss variability, okay. So all of these are numerical descriptive techniques. But most importantly, what you need to know is just the first two, measure of central location, mean, median, and mode, as well as measure of variability that is standard deviation and variance. You need to carry these two understanding, okay, mean and also standard deviation throughout our courses, okay, where you, when we discuss estimation, topic on estimation, you need to have mean and standard deviation. When we discuss hypothesis testing, okay, we still need to know about mean as well as standard deviation. 
Okay, let's look at the first part of chapter 4. Okay, uh, we are looking at measures of central location or measures of averages. Uh, uh, there are other names, of course. Okay, the first part is what we call as arithmetic means. Or uh, simply, okay, the common words or the, the every ma uh, everyday words for it is averages. How you calculate averages? This is the formula, okay? Don't get scared of the formula, okay? Because averages is simply the sum of all observation divided by the number of observations, okay? That is in words, okay? Mathematically, we need to write this using formula. So, mean, okay, for population, okay, we use the symbol mu, okay? If you look at the left-hand side, that uh, U with a tail there is what we call as mu, okay? That is a Greek symbol. How you calculate uh, the mean for population? You take all the observation, you add it up. So you have the sigma there, okay? The sigma, okay, from I observation number one up to the N uh, number of observation or the last observation, okay? Take the value of XI, okay? And you add it up, divide by the total number of observation that is capital N, okay? If you are doing that for samples, it's more or less the same thing except that for sample means, okay, we use the symbol X bar. You must uh, put the bar on top of your X, okay, because capital X, okay, as I already explained, refer to your variable of interest. So you need to have a small X with a bar on top, okay, to represent sample mean. So again, for sample mean, you add up all your X, okay, all your observation from the first one, XI number one, up to XI the last one, okay, number N, and you divide by the number of N or the number of observations that you have. It looks uh, a bit uh, tough, but it simply add up all your observations, divide by how many observations that you have, that will give you your mean or your average. So this is notation on the symbol that we use, okay, the number of observation in a sample, okay, we use capital N. This is standard notation, okay, for number of observation in a sample, we use capital small n. And arithmetic means for a population, we use the symbol mu, okay, that is the symbol, okay, a uh, Greek symbol, while arithmetic sample for Sample arithmetic means for a sample we use x bar okay small x with a bar on top. Second measure of central location is what we call as median. What is median? Median is the ordered observation that fall right in the middle. Okay, so in this case, if you have the data, for example, uh, 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 nine observation data. Okay, 0, 7, 12, 5, 14, 8, 0, 9, and 22. So you have an odd number observation or 9 observation. What you need to do first is to sort them bottom to top and then you can find the middle point. So in this case, you have, okay, sort it up. Okay, you ordered from 0, 0, 5, okay, 7, 8, 9, 12, 14, 22, okay. And then you, uh, you have the one in the middle, okay, it should be the one in uh, red, okay, 8, okay, my, my yellow sign has uh, moved a bit. So in this case, you ordered, okay, you, you have 9 observation, so observation number, f uh, the, the one that uh, fall on the 5th point, so that is your median. What if you have an even number of observation? Look at the second examples. Let's say you have 10 observations, so your N is 10. So in that case, okay, you need to sort it up, okay, uh, sort the data from top to bottom or bottom to top. So in this case, you arrange, okay, 0, 7, 12, and so on and so forth. You get 0, 0, 5, 7, 8, 9. So your median, because you have 10 observations, so your median will be between your 5th and your 6th observation. So what is your 5th and your 6th observation? Observation number 5. The value is 8. Observation number 6, the value is 9. So your median will be average of those two. So you add up 8 plus 9, divide by 2. So you get your median for this particular set of observation as 8.5. So sample and population median are computed in the same way. The third measure of central location is what we call as mode. What is mode? Mode is the value that occurs most frequently in a set of observation. So if you have a set of data, okay, it's possible to have one mode or one model class 
or two mode or two mode class or maybe more than two okay sample and population mode are both computed the same way okay you just simply need to look for the value that occurs the most frequently let's look at the example on calculation of mode so for example you have here the data so you have data uh, even number of observations okay 10 so you have data value of 0 7 12 5 14 8 0 9 22 and 33 so the, the question that you need to ask yourself is that which observation that appear most often? So in this case, all the other observation value for, uh, occurs only once, only zero occurs twice. So in that case, the mode for this particular data set is zero. Okay, zero the value, not zero such as no observation. How this is a measure of central location? So if we look at uh, the histogram, Okay, the, the histogram, the, the bar that is the highest length, so that is your modal class. Okay, the histogram is drawn okay, using the same step as before. So you just need to look at the bar that is uh, with the tallest length, so that is your modal class. So now we have come to the, the relationship between all three, between mean, median and mode. Okay, so if you have a symmetrical distribution, so... A symmetric distribution is represented by the value of mean, median, or mode that coincide with each other. So you saw on screen there, okay, so you have mode in red, median in blue, and mean in white. So I just uh, make it uh, in three different uh, color and you know, they uh, lay next to each other. But actually, mean, median, and mode for symmetrical distributions, they are of the same value. So I can just put one line, so that is mean, that is also the median, and that is also the mode. Okay, so the right hand side and the left hand side of the histogram are still the same. They are symmetrical. So compared to a symmetrical distribution just now, okay, if a distribution is asymmetrical, that means not symmetrical. Okay, bear in mind the word symmetrical, symmetry, and asymmetrical is just the differentiate by the word A in front, okay, the, the letter A in front, so make sure you are able to uh, differentiate that. So for a distribution that is non-symmetry or asymmetrical, so it's either skewed to the left or it, uh, skewed to the right, so the three measures of mean, median and mode may differ. So in this case, if you look at the histogram, okay, the highest point or the peak is represented by mode, okay, so the peak is mode in uh, red, Okay, median is the, uh, the middle value. So if you have the whole range from the right to the left of the distribution, the middle point is always the median. While the mean, okay, by dimension, is, uh, you add up all the observation, divide by number observation, it will fall somewhere in between. So in this case, okay, if you have tail on the right hand side, so your mean falls to the right of your median and mode. So when it comes to the three measure of central location just now between mean, median, and mode, which is the best? Okay, so the answer to that question is first, okay, the mean is generally our first selection. Okay, there are reasons for that. I leave it for you to find out. Okay, but however, there are several circumstances when the median is better. Okay, the mode is seldom the best measure of central location. Okay, one advantage that the median holds is that it is not as sensitive to extreme value as is the means. Okay, uh, what is meant by this statement is that let's say you calculate the average income of uh, a population in Malaysia. Okay, so let's say we know for sure that average uh, everyone is, you know, uh, what so and so, okay, they have a certain... Uh, amount of income, okay, more or less between a uh, couple of thousand to ten thousand uh, per month. But there are one or two Malaysians who are very, very rich, okay, but okay, they, they are earning billions a month, but the, their numbers is uh, it's just one or two. So when you calculate the average income, if you add, if you calculate average income in terms of mean, you, you add those millionaire or billionaire in the the the, uh, the in order to calculate the average income of Malaysia so what you get is the average income for everyone we raise okay so that means means is sensitive to extreme value same thing if you look at the one class of student 
So let's say we are measuring the mean weight. So normally, okay, when we talk about normal distribution, everyone is average weight. But let's say you have one person or one guy in the class who are of uh, extreme weight. Maybe we can say it's obese, okay? So in that case, when you include one uh, obese uh, in terms of weight into the average calculation, so you get the overall average weight for the whole class has increased. So that is why sometimes, okay, we do not prefer to use mean, we prefer median. Okay, but the things uh, about using um, uh, mean and median, sometimes there are equations that is not, uh, doesn't make sense. For example, if you say about uh, median income, what does it mean median income? Does people actually earn that much? Or in that case, it's preferred for you to use a uh, mode, okay, what is the, the amount of income that occurs the most often. Let's say when we talk about the occupancy of hospital beds, okay, uh, let's say you calculate the average occupancy of hospital bed in any wards is, uh, I do not know, okay, maybe I do not know how you measure that, but you get point something something. Does it refer the actual fa uh, reality that happened in terms of uh, occupancy in hospital beds? Let's say we talk about uh, the number of kids per family. Let's say we have uh, the figure for Malaysia, I can't remember, maybe uh, one point something. For Singaporean, it's much less. Malaysia, a bit more. Okay, uh, China is one child per, uh, policy. Definitely, uh, their, their mean child per family is one. So in that case, if you have mean child per family is uh, 2.3 perhaps or 1.7, what does it mean? Because, okay, the fact is either you have one child or you have two child or you have three child, okay, three children. So in that case, okay, you have to make use of your own judgment to determine which one is the best measure of central location between mean, median, and mode. And please think of your own examples, okay, in terms of what are the most correct, okay, measure between this mean, median, and mode according to the circumstances that you choose. Next. Still discussing between the three measures of central location just now, between mean, median and mode, which one is the best measure? Okay, remember statistic, you want to make inferences, you use uh, sample statistic in order to predict population parameter. So in, to illustrate this point, okay, let's consider example 4.1. Where, okay, from the raw data that is given, you calculate the mean using the formula, you get the mean of 11, and you get the median, okay, the middle point is 8.5. Okay, now suppose that the responder who reported 33 hours actually reported 133 hours. Okay, we are talking about computer usage here. So obviously, this, uh, this responder is an internet addict. Or maybe it's possible that we have a typos in the data entry. So in this case, okay, from the calculation of mean, as you sh uh, see on screen, when you change from 33, one of the observation originally is 33, now you, you, uh, you make the observation to become 133. So what happened, this extreme value has changed the value of mean. So now you have your new mean instead of 11, just because of one extreme value, okay, so you have your mean almost doubles, okay, from 11 to 21. So this is the things about using mean, okay, if you have extreme values or you have outliers, so your mean has now, okay, does, it's not representative of the whole observation anymore. So if you look at the other observations, all the other observations are more or less around the same Okay, between 0, 7, 12, 5, okay, 14, 8, okay, 22 hours. But there's only one who is using 133 hours. So that is extreme value. So be careful. If you have extreme value, your mean will not be representative of your uh, data. When we talk about uh, measure of data descriptions, okay, the, after we discuss measure of location, Another way of describing your data is by discussing measure of variability or we call this as measure of dispersion. Okay, why we need to have a measure of variability? Because measure of central location or measure of averages, okay, fails to tell the whole story about the distributions. 
other than the, the middle point or other than the average value, okay, you are also interested to know how much are the observation spread out around the mean value. So in this case, just now, okay, we have two set of class grades. Okay, the business statistic as well as the mathematical statistic. So the mean is the same in each case. Okay, the business statistic as well as the mathematical statistic is the both have the same mean of 50. So you see the middle point is 50. But the red class has greater variability or greater dispersion compared than the blue class. The blue class is narrower in shape of the histogram. Okay, so it has less variability or less dispersion than the red line. You calculate, okay, measure of variability. Okay, we start with the simplest formula, okay, by looking at range. What is range? Range is simply the, diff, uh, the distance between the largest observation or the highest observation and the smallest or the lowest observation. So you look at the, uh, the example given there. So you have... Uh, data observation 4, 4, 4, 4 and 50. Okay, so you have 4% with the same value observed. Okay, 4 and 1 extreme value 50. So range for this data is given as 46. How you get 46? You take 50, you minus with 4. Okay, the small observation, so you get 46. But what if you change the data? You still have uh, a small number of observation instead of 5, now you have 6. Okay, you change a bit, vary a bit. So instead of 4, 4, 4, 4 and 50, so now you have 4, 8, 15, 24, 39 and 50. Still the highest and the lowest is the same. So range is still the same. But you see variation in the middle are different. So when you use range, okay, it's very simple to calculate. Okay, it's very easy to understood as well. But it has the disadvantages of uh, it has a uh, failure to provide information on the dispersion of the observation between the two endpoints. So range does take the value that, you know, uh, the extreme low and extreme high. But what about those in the middle? Okay, so what if you have two type of observation that is shown uh, on the screen? So range is no longer appropriate in this case. So because of that, you might need to consider other measure of variation. Another measure of uh, variation that you need to calculate or you need to consider other than range is what we call as variance. Variance from the word vary. Okay, so uh, the next uh, measure of variation is uh, what we call a standard deviation. So variance and standard deviation, these two are related to each other. So this is the most important statistic other than mean that you need to know. So for population, variance is what we call as sigma square. Okay, it's a lowercase Greek letter. We call that sigma. Okay, it's like an O with a head or something, square. While sample variance, we use the lowercase for S square. How do you calculate variance? Okay, to calculate variance for a population, this is the formula. Sigma square is equal to the sum of all observation. Okay, where you take the difference between the actual value, xi, you deduct with the population mean, mu, okay, that will give you the different, the distance between each observation from the population mean. You square the distance and then you divide by the, you add all up and then you divide by the number of observation. So the capital N there refer to population size. When it comes to the variance of a sample, it's more or less the same formula, it's just uh, we need to tweak the symbol a little bit. So instead of sigma square, we have an S square. So you, what you need to do is find the distance between each observation and the sample mean X bar. You square the, different, the distance, you add all the square uh, distance uh, together and you divide by the number of observation minus 1 because this is for small sample. Okay, take note, a small sample, the denominator is n minus 1. In order for you to calculate variance, first what you need to do is you have to calculate the sample means, okay, x bar. Then only you can calculate the sample variance. An alternative formula is to calculate sample variance directly from the data without the intermediate step of calculating the means. So this is the formula as shown on screen. 
I will skip this part. Okay, I leave it for you to find out in details. Before we go further, okay, discussing the different formula for variance, let's look at the application of variance. Why do we need to calculate variance? Okay, uh, this one is from example 4.7. Okay, the following samples consist of the number of jobs six students applied for. Okay, so, so we have observation 17, 15, 23, 7, 9, and 13. So what you need to do is find its means and as well as its variance. So what we, what we are looking to calculate is x bar as well as x square. So this one is for sample. So if we're talking about population, then you need to calculate mu, population mean, as well as sigma square, okay, population variance. Based on the data that is given just now, okay, we need to calculate sample mean as well as sample variance. So look at the first uh, row, okay, how do we calculate sample mean? This is a simple uh, data set, okay, in order for us to, uh, for you to see how we calculate sample mean. So I expect you to do something similar to this when it comes to exam. But in real life, okay, given that we have a large data set, okay, you don't need to do the manual calculation. You just get in your data, put it into the software and click the right uh, steps. Okay, you get the computer to do that for you. So for manual calculations, you need to use formula. So in this case, sample mean x bar is given as summation of all six observations. That means xi number one until xi number six. You divide by total observation, which is 6. So in this case, you add up 17, 15, 23, 7, 9, and 13. Because there are 6 observations, so divide by 6. So just now you add up the numerator, so you get 84. The denumerator is 6, so you get 14. So that is average job or the mean job part is where you calculate variance. By definition, variance is simply the distance between each point of x and the sample mean, x bar. So in this case, okay, you have uh, the first observation 17, you deduct with 14, that is the sample mean, okay, and you take the square difference. And then you have the second observation 15, 15 minus mean 14, and you square the distance. And then you do that for 23, Okay, the observation value 7 and then observation value 9 and then the last one is observation value of 13. So 13 minus mean, okay, of 14 and then you square the difference, okay, and then you divide by 6 minus 1, okay, for the, uh, the denumerator. So what you get, the sample variance S square equals to 33.2, okay. So I give the shortcut method, okay, in the third row, okay, that's how you do it, okay, you, you have the option using the second formula for, uh, in, for sample variance, or you can use the third formula for sample variance, the shortcut methods, but you should be able to get the same answer, okay, you need to use your calculator for this, okay, manual calculations. What about standard duration? Remember, standard duration is related to variance. So standard duration, I use the short form there, but in exam, make sure you write in full, okay? Standard duration is simply the square root of the variance. So you have sigma, okay? Population standard duration is given as sigma, okay? Which is equal to the square root of variance. So variance is sigma square, okay? While for the sample standard duration, so you have variance as square, you take the square root, they offset each other. So you have sample standard duration as an S, okay? So again, Okay, if you have standard deviation S, okay, so variance is simply S square. If you have population standard deviation sigma, okay, and then you have the uh, population variance sigma square. Population standard deviation sigma square. Let's look at an example of uh, standard deviation, the calculation of standard deviation. This is from example 8.4 in the textbook. Okay, this is about a golf club manufacturer which has designed a new club and wants to determine whether it is uh, it hit more consistently. More consistently means less variability or less dispersion than with an old club. Okay, so that's the step in terms of using computer. Okay, in Excel. Okay, so we, we produce the following table for interpretation. So you have the tables on the left hand side, the current 7 iron. So in terms of measure of standard duration, so you have the value is 5.79. Uh, 
You compare that with the new 7 iron, okay, by this golf club manufacturer, so you get a standard deviation a bit lower or much lower at 3.09. So what does it mean? So you can interpret based on this, the comparison, assuming that uh, you have taken all the other things into account, okay, between the current 7 iron and the new 7 iron, Okay, it's better, okay, for you, okay, in terms of the new 7 iron, it's more consistent, it hits more consistent distance, okay, in the new club. This is uh, about interpreting uh, standard deviation, okay. This is very important, especially when we discuss later estimation, as well as hypothesis testing, okay, normal distributions. We'll come across, okay, for example, 95% and 99% confidence interval, or you come across a 5% or 1% level of significance. Okay, why? Okay, we always set such and such confidence interval between 95% uh, and 99%. Why must we set a okay, level of confidence between 1% and 5% or at most 10%? So this is the answer. Okay, the standard deviation can be used to compare the variability of several distributions and make a statement about the general shape of a distributions. If the histogram is bell-shaped, we can use the empirical rule, something like a rule of thumb, which states that approximately 68% of all observations fall within one standard deviation of the mean, while approximately 95% of all observations falls within two standard deviations of the mean, and approximately 99.7% or almost 100% of all observation fall within three standard deviation of the mean. So the rule of thumb, 95%, that is two standard deviation. That is the most important thing that you need to remember. This is uh, how we show what uh, I shared with you just now about the empirical rule. So if you have drawn your histogram, okay, because for a larger set of data, your histogram will look like a smooth curve instead of the jagged curve. Okay, so basically, it's still using histogram, it's just that I smooth it up. Okay, so if we look at the top uh, graph, okay, it shows that approximately 68% of all observation falls within one standard deviation of the mean. So that means if you're making estimation, okay, you, so you know that, you know, 68% correct. 60% probability that, you know, you are making the right estimation. While the second uh, diagram is talking about approximately 95% of all observation falls within two standard deviation. Uh, specifically, two standard deviation of the mean refer to 1.96. Please just memorize this figure. Two standard deviation basically refer to 1.96. Okay, you run it up, okay, it becomes two. While the bottom diagram shows that approximately 99.7% Okay, that means just a little uh, bit of lack of 0.03% of all observation falls within three standard deviations of the mean. It's the actual number is actually 2.58. If you round up, you get three. How do we interpret standard deviation? What does it mean? Okay, so suppose that the mean and standard deviation of last year midterm test mark are 70 and 5. That means mean of last year midterm test mark are 70. And then standard deviation is 5, respectively. If the histogram is bell-shaped, then you know that approximately 60% uh, of the marks falls between 65 and 75 because you have a range between 0 and 100, okay? So 0 and 100% marks. So if the, the mean is 70, okay, the middle point for that distribution is 70, so one unit... Okay, one standard deviation from 70 is plus minus, so you get between 75 and uh, 60. That means 70 plus 5, that will give you the uh, 75 range. Okay, and then 70 minus 5, that will give you the 65 lower range. While if you're di discussing the approximately 95% of the marks, we're talking about two standard deviation from the mean. So, two standard deviation of the mean, so that means 70 plus 5. 5 times 2, so you get 80, while 70 minus uh, 5 times 2, 10, you get 60. And then when we talk about 99.7% approximately of the marks fall between uh, 85 and 55. That is uh, 70 plus 15, you get 85. 70 minus 
15, then you get 55. This one with the assumption that your distribution, your histogram is bell-shaped. If the histogram is not at all bell-shaped, you can say that at least 75% of the marks fall between 60 and 80, and at least 88.9% of the mark fall between 85 and uh, uh, 55. We can re use other value of k as well. The measure of uh, variation or the third measure of this version is what we call as coefficient of variation. What does it uh, mean? Coefficient of variation is the standard deviation of the observation divided by the mean. So you have measure of uh, central location mean and just now you have measure of variation in terms of standard deviation. So you take these two, you divide. So for example, in this case, population coefficient of variance. I use a lot of short form there. You just take note the original uh, words. Okay, Population coefficient of variance. In short, I use capital CV. is given by the population uh, standard deviation, sigma, divided by the population mean, mu. For sample, okay, the same thing, coefficient of variance, small CV, equals to the population standard deviation, uh, sample standard deviation, S, divided by the sample mean X bar. Okay, to provide a proportionate measure of variation, for example, a standard deviation of 10 may be perceived as large when the mean value is 100, but moderately large when the mean value is 500. So it gives you a proportionate measure of variation. That's why you need to calculate coefficient of variation. The fourth measure of uh, dispersion or the fourth measure of uh, variation is what we call interquartile range. Okay, the quartile, okay, from the word quarter can be used to create another measure of variability that is the interquartile range. Okay, how do you calculate interquartile range? Simply take the third quarter value, deduct with the first quarter value. So it measures the spread of the middle 50% of the observation. Large value of this statistic means the first and the third quartile are far apart. That means high level of variability. You just look at the middle 50% of the observation. We are still discussing the interquartile range. Just look at the red line. So it's just to show from the left to the right hand side. So let's say this is the range of your observation value. Okay, so if you took the highest observation okay, the, or the maximum observation, you deduct with the lowest observation or the smaller observation. So that range between the right hand side for the point and the left hand side for the point, that will give you the range. Okay, that's the first formula when we discuss measure of variation. Interquartile range is just the middle 50%. Okay? So in this case, middle 50%, you need to calculate the first quarter value. Okay, we call that quartile 1. And the third quarter value, quartile 3. And then you find the difference. So that is interquartile range. The middle point for interquartile range is what we call as median. Remember? Okay, median is simply the middle point between the smallest and the largest observation. So we have come almost to the end, okay? So this is simply to recap what you already uh, come across so far, okay? In terms of the symbols and, okay, how do they differ? How do, how do they uh, basically similar to each another, okay? So you need to be able to differentiate between the symbol for population as well as the symbols for samples. So when we talk about size, size of uh, population is capital N, while size for sample is what we use uh, as small n. When we talk about population mean, we use Greek symbol for mu, while the uh, sample mean we use x bar. Same thing when we discuss variance, population variance is given as sigma square, while sample variance is given as s square. Standard deviation is without the square, so we have sigma for population and s for sample. Coefficient of variation for population is capital CV, small uh, CV for the sample coefficient of variation. And then we have the covariance, between, if you, we discuss two variables, covariance for X and Y, okay? And then we have S for X and Y for if you have two sample uh, covariance. 
And then we have coefficient of correlation. Uh, that one is a Greek symbol for rho. It's actually, it's not P, it's a Greek symbol. Okay, we pronounce as rho. And then we have the sample coefficient of correlation that is small r. Okay, the last coefficient correlation actually you will come across when we discuss time series as well as when we discuss uh, re uh, regression. So basically, okay, we have covered and we have discussed and we have achieved the objective that I laid out earlier. So bear in mind, okay, I hope by now, okay, you know what statistic is all about. Basically, you are using data, okay, uh, you are using statistical tool, okay, in order for you to gain information from raw data. Okay, you already know all the key concepts of statistics, especially the difference between population as well as sample, between parameter and statistics. Okay, and then the second objective when we discuss the graphical and tabular discrete techniques, I already discussed with you, there are three different types of data from nominal data, interval data, as well as the ordinal data. We are more interested in terms of interval data where you can present interval data in terms of histogram as well as ogive where you need to calculate the relative frequency as well as cumulative relative frequency. And the third objective is from chapter 4. I already discussed with you numerical descriptive techniques in terms of averages. There are three types of averages in terms of mean, median and mode. You can uh, refer to the YouTube again in order for you to make your understanding clearer okay and then we have measure of variability or dispersion in term of range in term of interquartile range in term of standard duration variance coefficient of variation and then we have skewedness whether the histogram is symmetrical or not symmetrical if you have your tail of histogram on the right hand side that is skewed to the right if you have the tail of your histogram skewed to the uh, with, on your left hand side of the histogram that is skewed to the left. Uh, just one thing for you to ponder, okay, for example, okay, don't just take what I said at face value. You have to think on your own. You have to come up with your own example. For example, okay, how do we decide when to use mean, when to use median, or when to use mode? Same thing. When do we need standard deviation? When do we need interquartile range? You have to know that by uh, trial and error, by working with a lot of examples, then you know which one is the best measure to use. So in this particular examples, okay, that I took from the internet, okay, the article is about the worst uh, and the best USCT for salary growth. Okay, this is for people with college degree or in Malaysia we call it university degree. So it st state that location make a big difference. Okay, so in this case, the discussion is about uh, salary growth so they use median wage okay so median wage okay for between the cities they use median wage the median well, value of wage okay while across the nation okay when we talk about uh, the increase okay uh, uh, in uh, mid uh, wage they use average of three percent that means the normal mean so you see we have two different uh, measure of central location we have median wage we also have uh, average uh, wage increase, okay? So basically, you need to, to be able to differentiate when to use which measure. Okay, we have come to the end of part one of JKE 316 Quantitative Economics. So we already covered the three objectives, basically from chapter one to chapter four. So I hope for students of PJJ, don't forget to submit your assignments. And for the rest of you who are going through the course, okay, with me just now, okay, make sure you try all the questions, okay, do try the manual calculation using calculator, and do try the, the calculation using software, okay, perhaps I will share with you, okay, in another session how you use your, your Excel in order to come up with all the different measures, okay, so let's uh, work hard, okay, and let's aim for an A plus for your result and have a great academic year ahead. Thank you.